Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the last century, Romania was blessed with many great elders. Some of you have heard of Elder Cleopat, and probably have read his life or seen him on YouTube or various sources, a pretty famous elder. Well, his elder was a, a man named Paisios, not the Paisios of Mount Athos that many of you have heard me speak about or read about, but his name was Elder Paisios Olaru. He, for most of his life, was a hermit at times, and he certainly lived a very austere life. He's quite a simple man, but a rather profound man, his simplicity. One story he told, which struck me the other day, really in light of this gospel, which the Lord uses words which are shocking and, quite frankly, fearful to us. He talked about this woman that lived in a nearby village named Katrina, and every day he would hear her speaking to death as if it were a person. She was speaking to God, the way it works out, sort of a metaphorical thing. And she, you would hear her say, Holy Death, please let me know in advance when I will depart so I can prepare. The next day you would hear her say it, day after day you would hear her going by, Holy Death, please prepare me so I will be ready at the time of my death. Well, after some time, maybe years, Death comes to Katrina and says, Katrina, it is time, come, it's time for your death. And she says, death, didn't I ask you all these years, didn't I ask you all these years to tell me in advance that I was coming? I prayed and prayed that you would let me know in advance. Why didn't you tell me? Responded, didn't your ear hurt? She said, yes. Didn't your head hurt at times? Yes, it did. Didn't your heart and your leg have pain as well? Well, yes, those did too. That was me telling you to prepare. She said, is that how you speak? Said, yes, that is how I speak to people. It's a pretty shocking story, actually. But it is exactly what is afflicted in Elder Sophroni and many elders, that those harbingers come really early in life, the little pains, the colds, the sicknesses, to prepare. We aren't immortal. We need to be ready for our death. We need not to be as those virgins who were locked outside who did not prepare their lamps. That's exactly what we have with the rich man. The rich man had harbingers as well, but he had everything else that he wanted in his life. One of his messages was Lazarus, sitting at the gates, lying in filth, with sores, with dogs licking his wounds, with nothing to eat, and begging that he might have something, but getting nothing. While Lazarus, while the rich man sat there sumptuously feasting, having everything that he wanted, dressed in beautiful clothes, the most comfortable things in the world, thinking that he had it all. Not listening. But the Lord tells us also we would make friends of the unrighteous mammon. That unrighteous mammon is that extra that we have. And he didn't give this man anything, ever. And notice Lazarus, we never have any reference here of him complaining. He doesn't complain about his lot in life, he endures it. Day after day after day, not cursing God much as Job, but day after day. <clears throat> and the story goes that the angels come of a sudden and take Lazarus away to the bosom of Abraham, which is in the presence of God, which is really a just metaphor because, a type, because who is Abraham? He is a symbol of hospitality. And he shows hospitality to this man, Lazarus, as well. And the other man dies as well. Notice we don't have a name for this man. Not even known to God at this point, because he has really denied God in his way of life. Fathers see the demons coming as taking his soul, of course, casting him into Gehenna. And he is not pleased, of course. This is not where he desires to be. He had gotten used to a different way of life, ignoring 
with bad faith, ignoring any difficulties or trials. But that was his message throughout life. There was Lazarus sitting over there. <clears throat> Wake up, rich man, because this is for you too. You need to be serving this man. The Lord tells us to give to the poor. The Lord tells us to give all to the poor. The Lord tells us to not lay up our treasures on earth, to lay them up in heaven, to give alms. God loveth the cheerful giver, we hear in the scriptures. But this man would give nothing, day after day after day. Now, in this life, Rabbi Palamas talks about how we have a trading system, sort of, because none of us have all the gifts. You know, one's a banker, one's a teacher, one has ability to do electricity, various skills we have. None of, them, none of us have all of them. So we go to the other one, we either trade money or whatever gifts we had or sort of skills we had at certain times in history that we might have some of what they had, and it all worked out in a nice little balanced system. But, he says, in the spiritual life, that is not so. One can't have chastity and go trade a little bit of chastity for honesty. One can have great diligence in prayer and go trade that for you know, humility that he doesn't have. We are called to have all the virtues, to gain them through humility. But the Lord, in his mercy and his love for mankind, doesn't work quite that way. He doesn't demand all of it from us, even though it is desired for us to have those virtues. He tells us to be merciful to our brother, to love our neighbor, to not speak ill of him to not gossip, to not judge, to give to the poor, to give a kind word, a smile perhaps, to love. And then he gives us the kingdom of heaven, which is not a fair trade at all, because he's given us so much. It's not a fair trade at all. He doesn't work like we do. He gives us everything for very, very little in return that we give him. And so, all the rich man had to do was give him a crumb of bread, but he couldn't even do that. He liked his fine things a little bit too much, he was attached to the ways of the world, he liked his distractions. Imagine if he lived today, he would immerse himself in constant distraction and not God. <clears throat> and so, at the end of this parable, even more fearfully, here is this rich man and he sees Lazarus in paradise, in the bosom of Abraham. And he says that he would just like a little bit of cool water on his tongue. Notice, he wants his needs met still. He doesn't say, I'm sorry. He doesn't say, forgive me, I did this wrong in this life. He just wants <coughs> comfort. You had your good things in this life. But what about my brothers? You know, send Lazarus to them that they might hear. Once again, no forgive me, no repentance, no change of life. They had Moses and the prophets. We hear them. But we don't hear Moses and the prophets, and we still nonchalantly, without effect, go through life and don't turn to God day after day. And we hear Moses and the prophets day after day. And unlike us, the rich man did not have the benefit of someone who rose from the dead coming to see him. We do. We had the Lord risen from the dead who had come to us. Someone did rise from the dead and tell us the same message. And calls us to repentance and calls us to mercy, and calls us to love, and calls us to self-denial, and calls us to joy in the kingdom of heaven by just giving bread to the rich, to the poor man over there. Not to say, oh, he's going to take my money and buy drugs or booze. Not to judge him. It's free. But not even that. Everybody in this church is broken. Me especially. Everyone in this church is broken. Not met one person yet, despite all the facades that we're capable of putting on, little facial masks, that doesn't have brokenness. 
deep brokenness. He couldn't hide it. Perhaps that's better for everybody else. Everybody doesn't need to have all that pain all the time. So we do need that mercy. We do need that grace. And everyone in the room can be Lazarus or the other one. We can gain a name in heaven. That white stone with that name written on it in the book of the Apocalypse. We can have a name in heaven by just looking at each and every one of our brothers and showing some mercy and showing some love and not judging and not gossiping. And day after day after day, calling upon the holy death, who is God, to let us know. And indeed, He will, every single day, let us know that He is coming for us at some point in our lives. So we cannot claim, no one in this room, knowing our own frailties, our own brokenness, no one in this room can claim that we need Moses and the prophets to come to us. We have messages day after day after day after day saying, you are not immortal. Your soul is by grace. By grace you are immortal, by my grace. Imbibe in that grace by turning to me in repentance and living that life of mercy and kindness and humility. Come to me and I will give you rest, is what the Lord tells us. So open your hearts as Katrina didn't quite get in the story, as the rich man certainly did not get. But Lazarus <coughs> did get. And whatever happened in his life, he just accepted and embraced and lived, no matter what the trials were, he did not curse God. He lived a life that showed us the life, not complaining, but enduring day after day, and not trying to live this life as if this was it waiting for the kingdom to come, as Katrina hoped for, when it came. May we learn from these two parables, as they are so profound, that God is with us, that God calls us, that God desires to be with us. God also desires us to show just a little bit of mercy to everyone in the world around us, as we have been shown so much mercy. Amen. Amen.